had enough coffee and tea to keep you awake? Yeah? <laughs> okay, excellent. Uh, it's good to have coffee on this kind of retreats, otherwise everybody be asleep already. So coffee is very handy. I also have lots of coffee on this kind of retreat. So, <laughs> so very good. Uh. Okay, so let's see what the questions are today. Has everyone had a chance to ask questions? Uh, there's more paper over here if you want to ask more questions. Uh, so just, uh, just go for it. Don't feel shy, yeah, you can ask any questions you like. I'm very, tend to be very open, uh, very happy to take any kind of questions. Uh, and usually people are very polite anyway, so it's not usually a problem. Uh. Okay, so let's, um, let's start. Uh, question number one. Dear Ajahn, num question, this is num sub question one of question one. Do the jhana levels have to be accessed one by one sequentially. Uh, can we, uh, can we sp skip to specify to a specific level? Uh, <laughs> and uh, the answer to that is that uh, yes, you can. But you can skip to a specific level, yeah, but you have to be very skilled. It's not something you can do just like that. You have to train many years. And when you train in the right way, you can decide on which jhana to go to. Yeah, you sit down and you decide, now I want to go to the third jhana, and then the mind, bing, goes into the third jhana. Yeah? <laughs> but you have to have developed the samadhi very strongly beforehand, so you know what you're doing, you know how to access these things. But even when you determine to go straight to the third jhana, it's like the mind goes quickly through the other jhanas on the way to the third jhana. Yeah? So kind of the mind goes boom, first, second jhana, bing, into third jhana, and then it stops, it stops there. Yeah? So if you are very skilled, and, but this is like, takes many years, you have to be like Ajahn Brahm, superstar, to be able to do these kind of things. Yeah? Very few people can do this. And then you can decide how long you want to stay. You can stay for one hour, ten, ten hours, twenty hours. <laughs> yeah, stay a very long period of time into this jhana. That's how you know it is a real jhana. You can stay for incredibly long periods of time if you really want to. Just all night, just blissed out all the time. So yes, you can. You can decide the level in this way, but you always kind of quickly go through the other ones. Like you, it's like you. Um, I think uh, the simile Ajahn Brahm is like when you go through a number of rooms. Yeah, if you want to, if there's one room after the other, to get to the end room, you have to go through the other ones. Otherwise, you can't get to the end room. But you rush through the other ones, bang, and go straight to the end room. You have the momentum, bing, and you go through the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> you don't hear those sounds in jhana, but they, these are just uh, <laughs> these are special effects that I produce. <laughs> okay, so that that is how you. That's what happens. So in a sense, it is sequential, uh, and it's also when you start learning the jhanas, you start learning by going to the first one. Uh, and the specifically, the Buddha says in the suttas that when you learn the first jhana, you have to learn that thoroughly before you go on to the next one. Yeah? So you learn one properly, you learn how to enter it, how to get out of it, how to stay there. And once you kind of master the first jhana, then you go on to the second one. If you go too fast to the second one, you lose both jhanas, both the first one and the second one. You lose everything and you can't go back in again. Uh, so you kind of you try to be systematic in your cultivation of samadhi. Yeah, it's very difficult. As I mean, some of you, as lay people, you live very good lives, so maybe you can able to do this. Some of you are single as well. Yeah, which is very handy to be able to live this life fully. Because when you have sing when you don't have any responsibilities, it's easy to do these kind of things. You can just focus on the spiritual path. And uh, some single people in this world, they're almost like monks and nuns anyway. Here, yeah, some of the people we have in Perth, they live on eight precepts all the time and these kind of things. Uh, it's kind of amazing. I'm astonished at how they can do that, uh, even outside the monastery. So you can go a long way as a layperson if the conditions are, are right for you. Question number two. In the case of the Buddha, before his enlightenment, his previous two teachers taught him to attain the highest 
levels of the immaterial realms, highest two levels, did he not attain all the jhana levels since he has already attained the arupa jhanas? Why couldn't he attain enlightenment at that point? Yes, that is a good question. And uh, it is hard to know exactly what happened uh, at this point. There are a few theories about what happened. Uh, and um, there's two possibilities that I think I would like to point out uh, that may answer this question. The first one is to remember that when the Buddha practiced under these two teachers are called, uh, are called Alara Kalama and Uddhaka Ramaputta. These were famous teachers at the time of the Buddha and they are talked about in a few places in the suttas. You come across these two, uh, two teachers. They were like part of the Brahmin outlook, the Brahmanical way. The Brahmanical religion is the precursor to modern day Hinduism. It's a kind of proto-Hinduism, the way it was two and a half thousand years ago. Quite different from what Hinduism is now but the same stream of religion if you like uh, and in the Hindu religion already back then this was before they had the Advaita Vedanta and the kind of all, all of these kind of things uh, they practiced Samadhi in Hinduism yeah this was kind of known at this particular time uh, and so when these teacher taught these teachings to the Buddha they were like Brahmanical teachings, the Brahmanical teachings have a very strong idea of the self, yeah? Brahma and Atta being the same thing. This is very much what Hinduism is about. So the self is a very important thing. So when they attain Samadhi, the way they interpret that attainment is they have attained unification with Brahma. Yeah, it's like a Christian. If a Christian also attains a Samadhi, the Christian person would say, I've attained unity with God. Because this is how Christianity interprets these kind of high states. Why? Because it has the characteristics of God. Lots of happiness, uh, no sense of self. Yeah, you have merged with the universe. It has all of these kind of things that people will say are signposts of this kind of attainment where you have unified with God. Uh, so the Brahmanical teacher will interpret it in a certain way. Uh, but uh, the problem is that that interpretation may not be correct from a Buddhist point of view. Uh, yeah? So when the Buddha attained these particular things because they are based on wrong view, he is not actually practicing Samma Samadhi, he is practic practicing Micha Samadhi. So this is Micha Samadhi, Micha Samadhi cannot lead to awakening because it is based on wrong view. So even though the state is the same, you interpret the state in the wrong way, then it cannot lead to enlightenment. Samma Samadhi in the suttas is defined as jhana, immaterial attainment, any kind of deep samadhi, conjoined with the other seven factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. If the other seven factors are not there, it is not Samma Samadhi. It's wrong view, therefore it cannot be Samma Samadhi. It cannot lead to awakening here. And this is why I think when the Buddha later on sits down and he asks himself what is the path to awakening he has rejected sensual pleasures he has rejected the self mortification the two extremes yeah then instead of thinking about the time under these two teachers uh, because it was wrong view he has kind of rejected that he cannot think back to that uh, he actually instead thinks back to the time when he was a child uh, because as a child he didn't really have wrong view yeah because there was just the attainment. He wasn't practiced in a particular path. He was like he was empty of views. And that's why that was more conducive to enlightenment than the actual attainments that he had under these teachers. This is one way of looking at this, yeah? There are actually there are a few ways. Another way of looking at this whole thing is that it is possible that these attainments under these two teachers were not actually immaterial attainments. It may be that they were a lower form of samadhi, pre-jhana samadhi even. Why? What is the evidence for that? And uh, the evidence for that is that uh, when you look at the suttas, that are one of the things that I have always enjoyed to do is to do kind of parallel research in the suttas and other suttas that are the same as the Pali ones but handed down in other language, handed down in 
a classical or not a, is it called classical ancient Chinese yeah or, or in Tibetan or Sanskrit or whatever and then compare do comparative study of the suttas uh, this is one of the ways of finding out what may be the most ancient aspect of the suttas uh, and if you compare the sutta that gives this teaching this teaching is found in the Arya Pariyasana Sutta Majjhima 26 the noble search is the English translation also found in the Mahasachaka Sutta Majjhima 36 the great Sutta to Satchika, also found in the Ma, in the Rad, Bodhi Raja Kumara Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 85. Found in one more Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. Number 100, I think. Something like that. Anyway, so, Sang. Um, um, anyway, it doesn't matter. It's found in a number of places in the Suttas. And the parallel to the Arya Pariyasana Sutta, the Noble Search, is a beautiful Sutta. And I read it out here last year, we're talking about the life of the Buddha, and it gives how the Buddha discovered awakening. It's very beautiful and very powerful. One of my favorite suttas, and I'm saying this word favorite sutta again, so many favorites, it's just, it gets really confusing after a while. <laughs> the whole Tipitaka is my favorite. <laughs> so, and if you look at the parallel in Chinese, preserved in Chinese translation, in Chinese, ancient Chinese characters, uh, if you can read ancient Chinese, and there are people who can read this sutta as an ancient Chinese, uh, I happen to know some of those people, they are actually friends of mine, they are monks as well, uh, and they have spent their whole life learning how to study these things. Uh, and when you read that, uh, it actually is slightly different from the Pali. Uh, and one of the differences is that uh, in the Pali it talks about these monks having the five spiritual faculties. Uh, yeah, remember we just looked at the sp five spiritual faculties before. Sada, confidence, virya, energy, sati, mindfulness, samadhi, yeah, and wisdom, which is panya, the five spiritual faculties. Now the samadhi is always the four jhanas. That is the spiritual faculty of Samadhi. So from the Pali, the Buddha is saying, well, these two Brahmanical teachers, Uttaka Ramaputta and Alara Kalama, they have these five spiritual faculties. So it seems from that that they have the jhanas, because that's what it means. And then they have the, later on it talks about the immaterial attainments. It is natural to think that they had those attainments. But in the Chinese, very interesting, in the Chinese translation, it doesn't say, it says they had three faculties, faith, virya, and wisdom. Yeah, sadha, virya, and panya. Not samadhi, it didn't have the samadhi faculty, according to the Chinese translation, nor did it have sati. Yeah, they weren't really practicing sati in the Buddhist way. So from the translation into Chinese, it looks like they did not have the Samadhi faculty, they wouldn't even have had the four jhanas. If they didn't have the four jhanas, then when they come to these other attainments that are considered to be the last two immaterial attainments, it probably means something else. It doesn't mean those immaterial attainments, because you wouldn't be able to have them without the four jhanas. So, what about the names then of these immaterial attainments? Because they are still have the names that are very similar. They call the uh, Neva Sanya, Nasanya, Ayatana, and the Akinsh, Akinsh, Akinshaya, Akinshayatana, something like that. And so they still the names are still very similar. So how can we then explain the names? Now one of the things that you find in Buddhism all the time is that the Buddha used the existing vocabulary in ancient India. He would take words like jhana, like arahant, yeah? and he would give them a new meaning according to the system that he was using. So jhana in the suttas means always the four jhanas. Prior to Buddhism, jhana could mean almost anything. It had a very, very large range of, range of usage. For example, they talk about the apanaka jhana, the breathless jhana which is just a kind of type of meditation they were doing, had nothing to do with jhana. Arahant just meant a spiritual master. With the Buddha, it meant a particular kind of spiritual master, one who has gone to the end of the path. So the Buddha would always use the existing vocabulary in ancient India, give it new meaning according to the Buddhist system. And I think he would have done the same. Yeah, these words like the Akinshayatana and the uh, 
neva sanya nasanya ayatana that very likely may also have been words that existed as general vocabulary in India, but they had a different meaning. Later on, the Buddha took them in and used them in a new meaning. They meant the immaterial attainments. But prior to the Buddha, they would have had a different meaning. And that meaning would then be the meaning used by Uddhaka Ramaputta and Alara Kalama. It's, I don't know what you think, whether you think this is right or not, it is just um, a bit speculative, yeah, because we can never know, but uh, the challenge is to get into a jhana state and then to remember your past lives and then go back in time and ask them yourself and see if you can ask them <laughs> and find out. That's the real challenge, yeah? To see whether you can do that, uh, and then you will really find out. But those are two explanations. I think w some of these explanations, one of those two is probably likely to be right, yeah? Uh, so most people would say the first explanation I gave is more likely, but I kind of like the second one as well. The Chinese translation of the Arya Pariyasana Sutta is generally more simple than the Pali one. I think it contains some archaic ancient features. So let me just expand on this a little bit, because this is actually quite interesting. I mean, it may not be interesting to you, but I don't care. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being naughty again. So. <laughs> What is, how do we, if the Chinese, the translation into Chinese only has three faculties, Sadda, Virya and Panya, but the Pali has all the five faculties, uh, how do we know which one is more likely to be correct? Uh, yeah, how, do, how can we say that? And the way we can say that is first of all compare the overall sutta. And the overall sutta, you find that the one in Chinese translation, which comes from the Sarvastivadan school of Buddhism, comes from a different school of Buddhism, is simpler than the Pali one. Simpler version is usually earlier, because usually people add to the suttas, but they don't subtract. Because by subtracting, it's like you're taking away the word of the Buddha. You can't really do that. But adding is always acceptable, acceptable because you're just adding more of the word of the Buddha. So there's more likely that people would add than subtract. Unless something gets lost. Sometimes things get lost as well. But in this case, it looks very unlikely because you have three of the factors. Rather than the five, it's unlikely that it got lost. If it got lost, all five would probably disappear. Yeah. So this is the first version, the first reason why the Chinese translation, probably in this case, may be more accurate. It's a simpler version of the same sutta. The second reason is that uh, there's a principle in Latin called the Lexio Difficilior, which means like the more difficult or unusual reading. Lex lex lexio is a reading. Yeah? It's like a lection or lecture or something like that. Uh, and difficilio comes from difficult, yeah, some more unusual, more difficult reading. Yeah. And the prin this principle, lexio difficile or poetry or something like that, uh, um, means that a more difficult and unusual reading uh, should be given priority. Uh. I'm just saying this Latin word, so it sounds a bit more impressive. Uh. You know what I mean? Uh, are you, do you feel impressed when I use kind of a few Latin words? It's pretty, pretty good, right? So that's why. Just to get, I get more authority that way. That's how this thing, these things work. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, a more unusual reading is more likely to be true. Why is that? And the reason is because if an, a reading is really unusual, uh, yeah, and if one reading is unusual, one is more standard, uh, Unusual things have a tendency to get standardized uh, because nobody really likes unusual things. There's a, ten a tendency, a movement toward standardization, people filling it out. Uh. But if you have a standard reading of a sutta, it is very likely that that standard reading will somehow become more unusual later on. Uh, because once it's standardized, everyone knows what it is. Uh, there's no reason for it to move to something more difficult. It will stay there. But the more unusual reading, very commonly it gets standardized to make things more easily accessible and understandable to the audience. So a more difficult reading is considered more powerful and stronger than the more standardized one. I don't know if you follow me, and it doesn't matter if you don't worry too much about it, it's just kind of interesting. This is what they call textual analysis of the texts, and it's kind of, uh, uh, this is how you gain, get to conclusions about whether these things are kind of sensible or not. So that is why 
uh, I would say, I would favor the one in the uh, Chinese translation, which comes from the Savasti Vardhan school. Originally, it would have been in some ancient Indian language, and it traveled to China via the Silk Road and went into China, and it was then translated in China by one of the early translators. I don't know who, Kumara Jiva or or someone like that, yeah, some of the early translators. And maybe it was, may have been Kumara Jeeva, I'm not sure. Uh, he was a famous translator in China. So that's how these things uh, come about. Uh, so uh, anyway, that's a long answer to your, your question. Uh, are you happy with that answer or not so happy? Uh, anyway, happy enough? Okay, good. So. Um, Okay, let's go on to the next one now. Okay, next question. What are the differences that you saw between Ajahn Kanha and Ajahn Brahm? Oh, the differences, okay. <laughs> um. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, what is the difference between Ajahn Ganha and Ajahn Brahm? And <laughs> Ajahn Ganha is this very famous Thai monk. Yeah. Ajahn Ganha is a nephew of Ajahn Chah. Yeah. So very, very famous. And he became a monk at Wat Pa Pong. And he was sitting very close to Ajahn Brahm. They were almost exactly the same age, both in years and also in monastic years. Uh, they're very, very close to each other. I think Ajahn Ganha might be one year older or something like that, but they're very close. And Ajahn Ganha stayed in Perth for almost six months, uh, yeah, so a long, long period of time. This was back in 1988 or 87. Uh, here is the famous story of patting the mayor on the tummy. <laughs> you know that story? Uh, anyone who doesn't know that story? Uh, don't know that story? Uh, Okay, this is, a, this is a famous story, okay. <laughs> this is Ajahn Ganha. This shows you the power of these Ajahns, yeah? This, this really shows you the power. So this, this was the time in Bodhinyana Monastery when we were doing all the building work. This was before I got there. I was very smart. I waited till all the buildings were up. Then I came to Bodhinyana Monastery. Yeah. This is a wis pra practical wisdom, they call that. Yeah. <laughs> and so I... <laughs> Uh, so they were doing all this building work. It was about 1987, 88, and they were like, having all of these complex buildings and they wanted to have them approved by the local shire. And because we are a monastery, people were thinking, monastery, these monks, are they dodgy? What, kind of, what are they up to, these, these kind of these weird looking people? And uh, so at this time, Ajahn Ganha was staying in the monastery. And uh, just then, as he was staying there, one of these days, uh, one of those days, the mayor yeah, of the local shire, he walks into the monastery. Yeah. And this mayor is an Australian man with a big tummy, yeah, really kind of, oh, really big tummy. He's been eating far too much and a kind of big belly hanging over his trousers and these kind of things. And uh, then the first person to see this mayor when he walks into the monastery is Ajahn Kanha. He sees this mayor comes in and he's very fascinated by this big tummy. Actually, now Ajahn Ganha has even bigger tummy, so... <laughs> but, uh, so he, he sees this man, this Australian man. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dyer, that's very kind of you. So he sees the mayor coming in, uh, and then the mayor walks in, uh, and then Ajahn Ganha, always so much metta, so much kindness. This is very powerful when you meet people like this. It's very tangible, yeah? So he's very fascinated by this Australian stomach, very large. And th in those days, in Thailand, stomachs were much smaller. Only Australia, in these days, in Thailand too, stomachs are increasing. But in those days, uh, in Australia, it was more like, you know, still already had those big tummies. Uh. So he sees this mayor, he looks at this stomach, then he walks up to the mayor, yeah? And uh, he walks up to the mayor, he puts out his hand, and he starts patting him on the stomach. You're not supposed to do that in Australia. I, I don't know, are you, can you do that here in Malaysia? Can't do it here either, yeah? Can't do it anywhere. It's considered very strange to go patting someone on the tummy. 
And what is so weird, because of the power of this person, instead of getting upset, instead of getting angry, instead of kind of you know being confused, he started to kind of giggle, yeah, and, <laughs> and laugh. Because the metta is so strong, you cannot really get upset in that kind of situation. And uh, Ajahn Brahm, he just came out too late and he was seeing this happening. And Ajahn Brahm thought, oh no, this is a disaster waiting to happen. Yeah, yeah. This is, you can't go and pat Australian people on the stomach. It's unheard of. But actually, it had the opposite effect. Because of the power of the mind, what happened, this mayor was so kind of taken by this Thai monk, a beautiful Thai monk, that uh, after that apparently, no more problems. We're getting permission for anything, yeah? <laughs> everything was kind of sorted out, uh, and everything was very easy afterwards. Everything is personal connection in this world. <laughs> <laughs> and this was the way we got a personal connection with the local shy here. And it, what it shows you is that if you come from the right place, if you have the right attitude, if you come from kindness and love and compassion, you can get away with anything. You can do, you can do things that nobody else in this world can do. Yeah, because of the power of your mind. And this is one of the things you see with, with these monks. Ajahn Brahm is a little bit like that too. This is one of the similarities between Ajahn Brahm. Ajahn Brahm too can say things that nobody else can say. Why? Because Basically because he, you know, he has a certain power to him. Ajahn Ganha is the same. If I tried to say those things, you would kick me out of here, never want to see me again. But they can say these kind of things because of that power of the person. So it's not just what we say, it's also where it comes from. How we say it is so important. And this was an example of that. So that's Ajahn Ganha. So what are the differences between him and Ajahn Brahm? Well, one of the differences, uh, first of all, the similarities are really great. Yeah? When, you go, when I go to visit Ajahn Ganha, he kind of praises Ajahn Brahm and says Ajahn Brahm is, uh, uh, is, is you know, kind of one of the very best monks around. Uh, which is, uh, of course, it's nice for me to hear that because I'm Ajahn Brahm's disciple. Uh, if Ajahn Ganha said, oh, Ajahn Brahm, really bad monk, it wouldn't be so nice. But, so he really praises Ajahn Brahm very, very highly. And there are other monks he talks about, he does not praise them so, <laughs> so highly. So it's kind of, in that way, it's also very interesting. Yeah. And then there is the power of the person. You get a feeling of somebody very special. So when they say that, uh, you get, you know, it's very, it means something to you. Yeah. So there is that power there, there is that kind of the sense of wisdom, the sense of thinking differently, the sense of being independent or not attaching to anyone. Uh, when you are in Ajahn Ganha's presence, uh, you get the feeling that he doesn't really attach to anyone. Uh, he is kind to you, but it's not really personal. Uh, yeah, he's kind to everyone. Uh, he doesn't really, he looks at you, but he has no sense of, you don't get that connection that you have with people when you attach to them. He's like aloof. He's above it all. You get the feeling of someone who doesn't really, you can't boss him around or anything like that. He's completely independent. Ajahn Brahm is exactly like that. The sense of independence. The sense of someone who does what is right without any attachment or feeling bound by anything. Yeah. You will never be friends with Ajahn Brahm in the same way you are friends with your ordinary friends. Ajahn Brahm is too far removed, he's too aloof, he's too kind of above it all. And Ajahn Ganha is exactly the same feeling. Yeah. Ajahn Ganha even more so. Yeah? Ajahn Ganha is like, whoa, it's really, really strange. So I, when I went to visit Ajahn Ganha, I'm not, I'm not really afraid of these kind of monks. This kind of, I, I, you know, you, I don't know why, but to me, they're so full of metta, how can you be afraid? I, I'm not really afraid, so when I go, I like to be a bit cheeky, you know, and to ask cheeky questions. And when, this is one of the great things about not being Thai. When you are a Westerner, they know that you are different already. They know you're a bit crazy as a Westerner. Yeah, we've got different culture. And because you are a different culture, they allow you to do things that nobody, that Thais cannot do. They accept that because you they understand you're from a different culture. And of course, I take full advantage of that. <laughs> I know that they will accept it, so for that reason I can take advantage of being an outsider. And so you can ask things that nobody else can ask. Yeah. So that this is the nice thing, so I can have more of an honest conversation with Ajahn Ganda. I'm not as... I try to be deferential, I try to be respectful, but not as deferential as the Thai people are, whereby they almost dare not say anything in the presence of a monk like Ajahn Ganda. So, um, 
Anyway, maybe I can talk about that later on, what I was asking him, if you know, or you can ask me if you're interested. Uh, but uh, what the difference between Ajahn Ganna and Ajahn Brahm is that Ajahn Ganna is a very simple monk. Yeah, he had almost no schooling. He had only four years of primary school. Yeah, so he's very simple. And the way he teaches is a very simple way of teaching. But very beautiful. It Dhamma doesn't have to be complicated, and I apologize for all the complications I have been making today. It just shows you how foolish I am. Yeah, that's really what it shows, all these complications. They're not really necessary. When you go to the real Arahants, actually, everything is so simple. Yeah, even with Ajahn Brahm, everything is so simple. A few jokes, a few nice stories, uh, that's all you get from Ajahn Brahm. And that's probably much better yeah, than all these complicated things. Uh, but, uh, so very simple. Whereas Ajahn Brahm is, uh, even though he comes across as very simple, uh, actually he's quite a sophisticated person in many ways. Uh, educated at Cambridge University, he has a very good understanding of modern physics. Uh, he got the first class honours, the highest degree you can get from Cambridge University. He's actually very intelligent. Uh, you, m you might not believe that when you meet him, <laughs> because he likes to mess around so much, but actually he's a very intelligent person, and very wise. This is kind of a powerful combination, wisdom and intelligence, merging into one, and that is what Ajahn Brahm is. Ajahn Ganha, is he intelligent? Maybe he is, I'm not sure, it's very hard to tell <laughs> when somebody is at that level. I don't really know whether he's intelligent. He's certainly very wise, uh, and he's very, uh, very much meta or whatever, but he's a simple person. He doesn't know much about the world or about anything really. Very simple. Uh, and in one way, that's the beauty of a person like that. Simple but powerful. Ajahn Brahm is more sophisticated but powerful. In this way, they are different. Uh, and I would say that when you meet Ajahn Ganha, you feel like uh, this may be even more metta, even more peace, yeah, than with I mean, Ajahn Brahm has a lot, but maybe taken even to one level higher with someone like Ajahn Ganha. Yeah? And they praise each other. Yeah? Ajahn Ganha says, oh, Ajahn Brahm is one of the best monks. Uh, Ajahn Brahm says, if there's an Arant in the world, it's probably Ajahn Ganha. Yeah? So they kind of, you can see they are on the same wavelength. Uh, they look at the Dhamma in the right way. Uh, in the same way here. So, uh, yeah, if you have a chance, please go and have a visit of Ajahn Ganha. It's kind of, it's really nice, even if you just go over there and say hello, and just sit in his presence for a while, yeah, and feel, feel Ajahn Ganha a little bit, it's kind of a nice thing to do. Uh. Personally, I prefer to have Ajahn Brahm as a teacher, because Ajahn Brahm is more articulate, he more bases himself on the suttas. So I personally, I prefer, also I cannot understand Thai, so that kind of is a, is a little bit of a disadvantage. But um, yeah, that is, uh, I will talk more about Ajahn Ganha later on, because it's very interesting to meet these, these monks, they are rare. There is another monk that I mentioned before, Ajahn Liam, the, the abbot of Wat Papong. So if you think Ajahn Brahm, Ajahn Ganna, Ajahn Liam, then you have some of the very best monks in the world uh, right, right there. Uh. That's my opinion anyway, so other people might have different opinions. Uh. Okay, next one. Well, only two questions already, 40 minutes. Wow, that's pretty uh, amazing. Okay. After one becomes an arahant and there is no further rebirth, what then becomes of the person? Then you become a bodhisattva. Is that right? <laughs> oh, I'm being, I'm being naughty. I, no, you do not become bodhisattva. Yeah, because uh, you cannot become bodhisattva because when you are arahant, then there is no more rebirth. And that is kind of the whole point, because rebirth is dukkha, so if you want to be happy, it's no good to have rebirth, so then all suffering comes to an end at that particular point. Yeah, what happens? Well, if all suffering comes to an end, does it matter what happens? Doesn't really matter, right? What matters, the whole purpose of the path of Buddhism is to end suffering. So as long as suffering has ended, doesn't really matter so much what it is, yeah, or how it expresses itself. If everything just comes to an end, or if there is something happening afterwards, it's irrelevant. What matters is that suffering has ceased. If you are afraid of disappearing, the reason is because you have a sense of self. 
If you have no sense of self, there's no fear of disappearing anymore. Disappearing is kind of nice if you have no sense of self. Yeah, you want to disappear because appearing is a hassle. If a, if appearing is a problem, then disappearing is better. Yeah? So maybe you want to disappear. Maybe you just want to get rid of everything and just want to. You have had enough of all of this uh, and disappearing. Remember, one of Ajahn Brahm's books is called "The Art of Disappearing." Yeah, yeah. the art of disappearing. Yeah. This is kind of a very profound and beautiful title. The point is that once you lose that false sense of self, uh, you want to disappear. You understand that disappearing is something good. Uh, yeah? The end of suffering, that's what disappearing is. Uh, what happens when the arahant dies? Uh, actually, you don't really care about that. Uh, if you, the best thing is to disappear. But if something else happens, okay, I will take that as well. Uh. It's very hard to understand these things uh, because uh, the sense of self gets in the way and that's the problem really here. Okay, Ajahn, someone told me that the whole fruits that had been offered uh, to ancestors' prayers cannot be cut and served to the Sangha. Is it in the Vinaya or is it just a cultural belief? It's not really in the Vinaya, so you probably could do it, uh, yeah? but it is the uh, tradition that it is not done. Uh, and uh, part of the idea is that when you offer it to the ancestors, it has already been offered first to the ancestors, uh, then it's maybe it feels wrong to offer it to the Sangha afterwards. Uh, it's like you're trying to be, uh, I don't know, maybe trying to be a cheapskate or something. <laughs> 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 kind of get maximum out of these fruits, yeah? something like that. Uh, but uh, you probably could, in theory, there are some various theories uh, that uh, when you offer it to your ancestor, they will kind of take and eat kind of the essence of the fruit, so it won't have the same nourishment or it won't be the same afterwards. I don't know if I believe in all of that, but uh, uh, whatever, you can do these things. Nobody's going to tell you off if you do that. I wouldn't know anyway. Yeah? If you offered them afterwards, I wouldn't have no idea whether you offer it to your ancestors first. Uh, you know, this tastes a bit funny. Why is that? <laughs> 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 Did you offer this to your ancestors already? <laughs> So you can, you can do these things, but uh, sometimes it's nice to offer one thing to your ancestors, yeah? And if there was a remnant, give it to the animals or something afterwards, uh, and then offer something else to the monks. I think that would be more appropriate, uh, yeah? It feels more right, uh, but if you do it this way, I don't, nobody is going to punish you because of that. Uh, there's nothing to do with the vinya, and it's probably more a cultural belief. Uh. <coughs> okay, so, um, dear Ajahn Brahmali, I am asking on behalf of a very good Dhamma friend who cannot make it to this retreat. Uh, here are her questions. Uh, stream enter, once returner, non returner, arahant, are these called the stages of enlightenment? Yes. That's an easy question, isn't it? One word is the reply, okay, very easy. Question number two, can we say that stream enter, once returner and non-returner are enlightened to a certain degree, but not yet completely enlightened? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> can we say that an arahant is at the full enlightenment stage? Yes. <laughs> wow, so easy. <laughs> I don't even know how to expand. I, 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 don't know, I have no idea what more to say, so that's good. And then the same handwriting, I can recognize the handwriting. So, <laughs> dear Ajahn Bamali, it would be riveting to recall our past lives and verify them like the fellow Catholic did. Can we be introduced to the remarkable past life <laughs> regressionist? Certainly, if you wish to go to him, you can do that. I think he charges, yeah? You have to be aware that he charges for these things because obviously he has to make a living. So you, I, don't know, I don't know how much it costs, <laughs> you have to find out. But I think if you come from Malaysia and you say that you want to do it, I, I think it's, he probably will charge you. And, uh, but uh, he is the, actually he's now the president of the Buddhist Society in Perth. His name is Dennis Shepard. Yeah, some of you may have heard about Dennis Shepard. He's like this old 
grandfatherly person. Yeah, he's really kind of good, good-hearted, big-hearted. He's big, got big white hair, and he always has a smile, and he's a very, very friendly person. You feel really relaxed and comfortable in the presence of someone like that. Uh, so if you want to seek it out, you can. Dennis Shepard is his name. He's, he's the president of the Buddha Society at this moment, but he's going to step down at the next uh, annual general meeting that we're going to have in, in March. So, so please, please do so. Don't be, you, can, you can always contact him. But if you, do, if, you haven't got, if you haven't got his contact details, then uh, I can even provide you with an email address if you want to. Uh. How do we know if the past life regressionist is really accurate or if he or she is just making things up? Well, remember, it is not they who are making it up. You say these things yourself, yeah? And then it is recorded. So because it is recorded and you say it, you can listen to it afterwards, you can hear your own voice. Actually, you can even hear yourself as you speak these things, I think. I'm not sure exactly how it works. So it is actually you who are saying these things. Still, the problem is still the same. How do we know whether it's real or not? Is it actually the case? And uh, it is very hard to know whether it's real. Very often you just cannot really no, yeah, it is un uncertain. Uh, so that is why what happened with that fellow I was talking about before, why he took it to the Australian authorities to see if a person like that actually existed. Uh, and that is the best way to find out if it's real, is to compare it with existing records of people and to see if actually such a person really was there. Uh, that is the best way of doing this. Uh, but uh, very often you don't know, and very often it is just a creation of the mind, yeah? because the mind is very creative, the mind can create almost anything, uh, and then you don't, you, know, you don't really know. Still, it can be interesting. Still, it may maybe feel if it was right. Uh, you may have some kind of sense whether this is correct or not. Uh, maybe it matches with how you feel about yourself or whatever, uh, I don't know. Uh, and then perhaps you get some, you may still get some insight into yourself by doing this. Uh, it may still be worthwhile. What are the purposes of shaving the heads? Okay, now this, this is a different question, okay. What is the purpose of shaving the heads? And why is the Buddha rarely portrayed as being bald in the picture and the statues? Uh, okay. <laughs> mm. uh, yes, so the reason why the Buddha is portrayed in this way is because uh, According to the uh, marks of a great man, uh, the Buddha had his hairs kind of the, there's only one hair for every pore, uh, and that hair it turns clockwise in one circle, tick, like that, uh, and that all his hairs are supposed to be like that. So this is a, a way of portraying the marks of a great man. Yeah, that's why, why they do it in this way. Uh, and this is then what distinguishes the Buddha from any other monk, because only the Buddha has these marks of a great man. Uh, and you will see he also has, I can't see, yeah, he also has a thing between his eyebrows, yeah? This is called the Ushnisa, is this thing he has on top of the head. The Unna is the thing he has between his eyes. And these are also marks of a great man, this mark in the middle here. And that's why, again, you know that it is the Buddha. This is not like the mark on the forehead that you find Indian women often have. They have this mark on the, this is different from that, yeah? It's not the same thing, yeah? Well, this is the mark of a great man. And also the bun on the top of the head is another mark of the great man. This is how you differentiate the Buddha from other monks or other statues. Uh, this is how you know that. But actually, in reality, the Buddha, when he was alive, he also had a shaven head. He looked like a monk. Yeah? And that is why you know that from the suttas, because sometimes people would say, which one is the Buddha? There's all these monks there, which one is the Buddha? Yeah, so he must have been like everyone else, otherwise he, you would have known straight away uh, that he was different. Uh. So um, the reason you shave your head, this is the ancient tradition, the Samana tradition in ancient India. The Samanas are the ascetics who went forth uh, and who became ascetics in ancient Indian society. And those uh, ascetics, they always shaved their heads uh, and they wore robes. Whether they were men or women, they would shave their heads and wear robes. A little bit like what we do now, probably not exactly the same, but similar to what we're wearing now. Uh, in fact, the robes that they wore in ancient India were actually very similar to what lay people were wearing. Uh, at that time, lay people also just had, you know, 
they had a sarong. You wear a sarong now, same kind of thing. Like uh, you know, many people in uh, Southeast Asia go to Burma, Thailand. People often wear sarongs. Uh, do people wear sarongs here in Malaysia as well? Quite common. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Quite common. Uh, and the monks and nuns would do the same. And then you would have an upper robe, which may have been a bit shorter. Lay people actually also dressed like that in ancient India. So at that time, the difference between a monk and a nun and a lay person was much less uh, than it is now. Now we really stand out. In those times, uh, it didn't stand out so much. Uh, it's just that you had less frills. It was more simple, yeah, one color and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so this is the mark of an ascetic, it's the mark of renouncing society. Hair is something that is very worldly. Yeah? E every morning you make sure your hair is styled right, yeah? you kind of look after it and all of these kind of things. Hair is very important as a marker of uh, identity. I talked about identity this morning. It gives you a lot of identity that you have the right kind of hair. So the idea is to renounce some of that uh, excessive attachment to worldly things. And you do that by shaving off your hair. It looks quite cool anyway, doesn't it? <laughs> a lot of people have this kind of hairstyle, these, or lack of hairstyle these days. Okay, so last question for tonight. Dear Ajahn, sometimes the Buddha talked about uh, refrain. What's the difference between refrain and willpower? How does one incorpor incorporate inf refraining into one's practice? So refraining means that you abstain, you don't do something. Yeah. So you, you uh, refrain from breaking the five precepts, uh, you refrain from being a bad person, you try to develop your good qualities. Uh, that is the idea of refraining. Uh, and uh, you may think that you need willpower to stop yourself from doing bad things. Uh, and a little bit of willpower is handy, but far more powerful is wisdom power. Uh. So you try to understand why these things are bad. And if you understand that you shouldn't be breaking the five precepts, if you feel that that is right, actually it is quite easy to follow. Uh. If you really understand that stealing is a bad thing to do, you're not even going to do it, even if you're not keeping the five precepts, you won't do it. Because it makes you feel bad yeah, if you steal from others. If you lie, you feel bad about yourself. Y if you don't want to feel bad about yourself, why would you do these things to torture yourself? So you understand the connection between bad karma and how you feel. In fact, that is exactly what bad karma is. If you have a bad intention, you will feel bad about yourself. That is why it's called bad karma. If you understand that, and if you feel that is true through your own investigation and reflection of your own life, then why will you become immoral any anymore? You, but there's no point in being immoral. It's crazy to be immoral. The only person you're hurting is yourself. Do you want to hurt yourself? Do you want to be your own enemy? Or do you want to be your own friend? And this is something the Buddha says in the suttas. Yeah? If you want to be your own friend, you should be kind to others. Uh, because when you're kind to others, you feel good about yourself. Uh, so kindness to others is being your own friend. Being bad things towards others is actually like being your own enemy. Uh, because you are going to hurt as a consequence. Uh, so if you refrain, you refrain based on wisdom power rather than refraining based on willpower. Of course, sometimes you get you 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 do something you want to do something really bad, yeah. Sometimes you want to kill somebody. Have you ever wanted to kill somebody before? <laughs> Most people have, yeah. Sometimes you get really upset. Oh no, I want to kill that person. There was an interesting uh, research done. This was done in America a few years ago uh, about uh, they were asking the students at one of the universities in the U.S. Uh, and they were asked how many of them had had a fantasy about killing somebody in the previous year. And there was over 90% of the students had had the fantasy of killing someone in the previous year. It's quite common, yeah? And I don't think it's because Americans are particularly bad. I don't think so. I think we're all probably pretty much the same. So it's a very common thing. Sometimes you just get so upset with other people. I wish I could kind of make an end of these people, you know? Get rid of them once and for all. 
And uh, so that's why you have to use willpower and stop yourself. Okay, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, I'm not going to kill anyone. So you kind of force yourself not to, to avoid that. Uh, so sometimes you need to use a little bit of willpower to stop yourself from doing really, really bad things. Sometimes the urge overcomes you yeah, to do something bad, and then you have to hold back. But normally, far better to use wisdom power. Uh, if you use wisdom power, you don't get so tired. Willpower tires you out. Yeah, after a while, if you use a lot of willpower, you can't do it anymore, you can't really hold back anymore, and then all the bad things come out anyway, because you have used up all your energy. Secondly, if you use willpower to hold things down, to hold your bad qualities down, uh, eventually when you get tired, uh, yeah, and you let go, all the qualities come back up again, because you used willpower to restrain. Uh, if you use wisdom power, it abolishes the opposing qualities. Uh, this is one of the things I often talk about on meditation retreats, uh, and I will talk about this again here as well on Tuesday, Wednesday, on Thursday, when we get more into meditation practice. Uh, um, so the using of wisdom power actually is far more powerful in abolishing the negative qualities uh, than using willpower. So this is what we mean by refraining in the right way. It's different from willpower because you try to use wisdom instead. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah? So, and f with so wisdom, far more powerful than willpower. Uh, and this is the ideal that we should all strive for on this path, to use that wisdom instead. And then uh, uh, you will be going a long, long way on this path. Uh, so try to do that. Uh. Okay, so let's have another short break, uh, maybe 15 minutes until about 5.30. And if you want to come back, we will do a short guided meditation uh, at 5.30 here. Yeah.